Earlier this week, we reported on a situation that looks like it may be coming to a head in just over a week. Some miners in southern Oregon have been given a deadline to clear out of a mine that they've had since the 1870s. There's a clear chain of title, and the miners are asking for a legal explanation from the BLM, and they're not getting it. Oath Keepers have taken up a defensive posture there, one of providing security to try to make sure that nothing is going to happen until they can hear this through the court system. We're going to talk to Kirby Jackson from the Gleese Mining District. He's going to define for us what the mining district is. You'll be surprised. It's not just an association. He's also going to give us a history of what's been going on in the area. And you're going to see yet again how in 21st century America, bureaucracies are taking upon themselves to not only write the laws, but enforce the laws and have their own court systems. We no longer have a government of by and for the people. We have a government of bureaucrats who are running this by themselves for themselves to create their empire. So joining us now is Kirby Jackson from the Gleese Mining District. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Jackson. I guess one of the things we need to do first is kind of lay this out for the audience because most people are not really familiar with what's going on in mining. Let's start with the Gleese Mining District. This is not a club. It's not an association of miners. Tell us what this is. Uh, I am the recorder of what is referred to as the Gleese Mining District. Uh, way back in 1872, when Congress first established the mining law, basically what they did at the time, all the miners on the ground, they were, they were outlaws. They were regarded as squatters, and they were, had actually organized the first governments in a lot of these mining areas here. You know, we had mining camps and things like that. So the mining districts originally, they were the first governments in a lot of these areas before the counties and the states came about. So in... Uh, 1866, when Congress drafted their first mining law, it was actually really just a federal recognition of what the miners were already doing on the ground because, you know, our forerunners, they were the, the first government guys out here when we had a, an early frontier society. So Congress, when they recognized what the miners were doing, that's what they decided was the best thing to do. Uh, they recognized these mining districts, and they, more or less, it was the first time in history the any government in the world had actually recognized that the miners who were working the land should also have the right to establish the rules and regulations as far as how they obtained their property, how they maintained their property, and basically how they settled grievances among themselves. Okay, so, so you've got a lot of so you you've got a lot of different uh, small mines that are there, and this is essentially, as you point out on your website, it's an organization of self-government. But it's a little bit different for people because a lot of, you know, what we're looking at in the cities and the counties, a lot of people don't really understand, just like they didn't understand at the Bundy Ranch, that there are different kinds of property rights. You're not saying that you own everything there. You've got mining rights, just like he had grazing rights or water rights. We have hunters who have rights to hunt as they're on the land. So there's all these different multiple wow. uses that can exist on public lands at the same time, right? That's that's, that's right. And basically what the mining law did when it, when it was first established, the, the main core of it was finally refined in 1872 in what is typically called the, the General Mining Act of 1872. And that's, that's not its proper name. It was uh, had a very long name Congress had that they gave to it, and that's not important. But basically what they did was they, they established the first rights of miners, and what they recognized at the time was that, like other settlers, such as homesteaders and uh, woodsmen who were making their living by uh, harvesting trees or they were getting rocks, they basically recognized that these set these early settlers, they should have protection under the law. And mm -hmm. so basically they wanted to define those rights. So the, the early rights of the miners were they, they not only had the right to go out on the, the lands out here, which were held in trust by the government for the people, and that's, that's still the way it's supposed to work, and obviously this is part of the problem we have now, is that it, it's no longer the, the government doesn't want to treat it the same way. So basically at that time, Congress, they recognized that we need to establish what these guys have in the way of rights. So early on, they established that the miner had the right to go out and find these minerals. He had the right to develop his property for his benefit, which in turn would benefit the nation. And in return, he would have some protection under the law from whether it's the government or other miners or other users, and basically what they recognized was that in addition to that, early on, the miners had what they called exclusive possession and enjoyment of their property within the lines of their claim. And the way it works 
you go out upon the land that's you find an area that's unclaimed and you go out there and you look for minerals and if you find a valuable deposit of them that you think is worth do worth your time doing you have the right to claim that and that's done by recording it you know filing a location posting a location notice on the site so just kind of corner. exactly just kind of recording it just like you would if you're going to buy land to put your house on and and here in Texas for example it's very common when we buy a home that those mineral rights do not transfer. They're held by that, previous that, that, people. So we all need to understand right. as people are looking at this that there's different levels of property rights even on the same piece of land. And we also need to understand that a government that doesn't recognize our property <laughs> rights will treat us as if we were property, will treat us as if we were slaves. So to, to cap this up, this, these miners went out there in about 150 years ago and about the time mm -hmm. of the Civil War, they're mining this. They uh, set this up as governments. Congress recognizes this officially in 1872. But then we have this thing called the BLM that's created to ostensibly manage federal lands. And let's go to 1955. In 1955, there's a Surface Resources Act. And I think this has something to do, uh, at least the BLM is claiming that it has something to do with this particular case. So explain that to us and explain how this older mine, which goes back to the early 1870s, is grandfathered in and not affected by this 1955 Surface Act. Right. Yeah. So the, the 1955 Surface Resources Act, this actually has everything to do with it. And we, and we agree with BLM that it does have everything to do with it. So in, in 1955, Congress was starting to recognize that there were an awful lot of people out there. They were using, they were basically what they were doing, they were abusing the mining law. They were using the mining law to build private hunting cabins to squat on land. And needless to say, there were a lot of conflicts with other people who wanted to, to, to use the public land system. So Congress decided to change the mining law. And what they decided to do was that all claims that were located by miners and filed after that time, July 23rd, 1955, they did not, they had the right to use the surface, but they did not have a surface control or control of the resources and basically full willy-nilly uh, utilization of those surfaces, and uh, obviously the vegetative surfaces especially is what they were referring to. You know, so needless to say, the claims that were filed after that, they changed from the original meaning within the mining law, and that is something that still continues to this day. But they had to deal with the claims that were already there, and that is where this issue comes in. So Congress, they came up with three ideas, and these ideas they came up with. These were largely suggestions of the United States Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. And the three things they came up with were is that basically they recognized that they couldn't just tell these miners, hey, we're here now. You've had this all along. We're going to start taking your rights away. They didn't, they didn't do that or they didn't intend to do that. Mm -hmm. And so basically they, they provided some mechanisms for the miners to either, <clears throat> on one hand, they could say, I relinquish my surface rights back to the government, and I'm going to allow the general public to come out of my claim and camp here and, you know, get uh, cut fire with things of that nature, subject to whatever the government's, whatever the agency's rules are. So that was one option. Another option was the miner could say, well, I don't really want to deal with this anymore, so I'm just going to give up my claim. That was the second option. Now, the third option and this was, was the option that was best suited for most miners if they were serious, they could preserve their existing rights. And how this was done, it was done by filing with the BLM or the U.S. Forest Service what was called a verified statement. And the verified statement was basically the miner informing the government, hey, I am over here, and I'm going to maintain my rights. And what was done at that time the government then had the opportunity to go in and try to challenge those rights if they found there was a conflict with other uses, you know, such as timber harvesting or public recreation or wildlife management or something to that extent. And needless to say, there were avenues where the government could go down, they could challenge the validity of the claim and basically say, you're not really a miner, you know, you're somebody else, you're right. just a guy abusing the mining law. And needless to say, the government set up guidelines that they had to follow to either basically to take that surface away from the miners. Okay, that's good. And now let's talk. Up. Let's talk about this specific, uh, specific case, the sugar pine mine. Uh, this is the one where we have the conflict. 
Am I correct to say okay. that the BLM is saying that because of uh, we're, we're exercising these uh, surface rights regulations, and yet you're saying that the sugar pine mine has already registered in a grandfather clause uh, position, right? Is that correct? That's, that, that's, that's correct. So the, the sugar pine is actually, it was the, the first hard rock gold mine discovered in the state of Oregon, and that was back in 1858. Mm. And it went through some assorted owners uh, between 1858 and 1876, and there was a lot of changes of ownership. And even though sometimes the, the mine wasn't being worked, there were miners who had various property interests interest on the claims, such as there were two arastas on the property. There were some ditches previous miners had dug. There was a water wheel on it at that time. And needless to say, a lot of those rights, they were preserved. But on February 9, 1876, uh, there were two men by the name of George Green and Dan Devilbiss, and they decided that they wanted ownership of the sugar pine, and they adhered to the mining law, and they did what they were required to do. They went up there, and they discovered minerals, and they basically staked and recorded their claim. So they recorded that in uh, 1976, and well, they also arranged with, the previous, you know, with some previous owners as far as those ditches and things of that nature, which were property to obtain them. So that is... This mine has been active and has maintained a current chain of title mm -hmm. since those two individuals, February 9th, 1876. Uh, Dan Devilbiss, who was a, a co-locator on that claim, he actually sold out to uh, George well, Green's brother. Uh, let's Dan. go back. Let's go back. I understand it's had, had a long chain of commandment. Let's go back to what just happened in March with the cease and desist order from the BLM. Tell us about what the BLM is saying, or can you, I, I've seen from your press releases, you're saying that you can't get any specific information from them as to what the legal basis is for them to say that the uh, sugar pine mine needs to cease and desist operation. Well, it, it's both. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what actually started this, is the owners have been actively, uh, have been under current ownership for three years. They've owned the mine for three years from the previous owner. You know, and we have a complete chain of title all the way back. And they, they've spent a, a lot of money, and I've, when we've all spent a lot of time, doing research to establish that. And BLM does not dispute that the, the chain of title is that long. That That's one thing to point out. Even okay. they don't dispute that. And basically what happened was is uh, off and on, George Backus, who was one of the <laughs> co-owners, he actually had fairly regular contact with BLM since he became the owner. And even even before, because there's quite a bit to the situation, and needless to say, he was in contact with them, and he had even spoken to employees such as Diane Perry at Medford BLM, which is our local BLM district here, and she was quite well aware that he was there and what his intentions were, and that basically, you know, George's background, he had a lot of uh, heavy equipment operation background as far as Road building, that's what George used to do, was he used to build logging roads until the timber industry was destroyed here. So needless to say, they were very well aware of that. What kind of sparked this, even though George had actually maintained pretty routine contact with with the local BLM people, and I've you know spoken in the past to local archaeologists and stuff, and they were they were certainly aware of, of George's ownership and you know, I think they kind of had a basic idea of yeah, what give us an idea, because we're going to run out of time sh shortly here. Uh, Kirby, yeah. give us an idea of what the BLM is saying. Certainly they recognize that this is a very long chain of title. What are they complaining about here? Uh, ba basically what happened is they actually there were two of their employees came out to the area, and they actually ran into the mine caretaker, but opposed to going to his his front door and knocking on the front door and saying, hey, we're, we're BLM guys, we're here, we have to do some work in the area. They basically disregarded that and they started poking around the camp and didn't identify themselves when they left. And the caretaker called the owners and he says, hey, I have these people, they're, they're trespassers, what do you want me to do? And the owner said, please stop them, find out who these people are because we have a, our economy locally is devastated, we have a lot of problems with thievery and vandalism and sure. things like mm -hmm. that. And he said, hey, the owners were very concerned, and he said, please find out who these guys are. I'm on the way. So basically they challenged and, their authority, and that made them mad? Is that what you believe uh, uh, that's, instigated that's all this? pretty much what it is, mm -hmm. is, is basically as, as these two guys were coming out, they were on quads behind two locked gates, and the caretaker took his truck, he blocked the road, and he stepped out in front of the truck, and he had a pistol at his side in his hand. He didn't have a holster, but he just held his pistol at his side, and he waited for him, and they rolled up, and he said, 
I'm the caretaker here. I need to know who you are and what you're doing. You're running around the camp taking photos. And they said, we're, we're BLM employees. And he says, okay, I would like you to identify yourself. I want some identification. And they said, well, we don't have to do that. And he said, no, you, you really do. He says, you know, to, tell me who you are. So, so they showed their cards, and they did identify themselves as two BLM archaeologists. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, that's fine. He said, you guys have a job to do. You guys can, you know, pretty much do as you, as you need. But he said, in the future, he says, this is a pre-55 claim. He says, we do have surface rights. He says, in the future, please call the, the owner. Or he says, come out here and knock on the door and just let me know you're out here so I know who you are and you know, mm-hmm. if you guys are out in the woods and, and you don't come back for a reason that, you know, if you guys get in trouble, I could help you guys out. So then and you start getting of, unexplained uh, bureaucratic uh, charges uh, brought against you yeah, after and, that. And kind of what happened was and instead of these guys saying, hey, that's very reasonable, they went back and they actually filed a complaint about <laughs> the caretaker. And they basically said he threatened them, mm-hmm. which he did, he did not. He, is, he has signed an affidavit of record that he did not do that. Uh, they basically sick to BLM special agent on him. And he is a, a very young guy, very hardworking. He's in his twenties. Um, he, he actually took over as caretaker because he had some equipment at his mine actually stolen and he kind of really didn't have a lot to do. So that's why he got together with George and Rick and they, I understand. they brought him in there. Let's, let's, and, uh, and let's talk about where we're, we're almost out of time. There. Hang on, Kirby. We're almost out of time. Let's get to where we are currently at this point. They've hired a legal counsel who's tried to ask the BLM why they're getting a cease and desist order. And, of course, as I mentioned right. at the beginning, uh, the BLM gave them a deadline of the 25th, which is a week from Saturday, to uh, get out or right. they, and to basically destroy, remove all equipment, uh, destroy all buildings, and fill in the mine tunnels. Uh, so tell us exactly where this is at the moment. So, that, so that's exactly what happened. There was a lot of going back and forth, us requesting information, them not supplying it, Freedom of Information Act requests being ignored. So then they send this notice of noncompliance saying, you guys need to stop. We're going to do this if you don't. And so the owners, they consulted with an attorney. So that is where that situation is. And in the meantime, despite that, BLM continue to keep coming out there. They're basically sending law enforcement guys out. They're harassing the caretaker. You know, they're calling him constantly saying, we want a meeting, we want a meeting. And he says, I don't have to meet with you. I did nothing wrong. And I have a, I have a right to, you know, not speak to you in this country. And kind of where it went from there is one day George and the caretaker were on the, the mine and there were two BLM law enforcement guys turned up. And one of them was a county deputy by the name of Jason Stanton. And he's actually a, he's a deputy. You know, and we had actually, uh, we've had meetings with the county sheriffs here. We've had a very good relationship with him. And he came out and he says, uh, you know, you guys got a, a stop order. He says, uh, I'm here to give you another one. You know, I knew, I do know that uh, the owners, they really believe that they were <clears throat> there to engage in some nefarious activities, see if they were gone and basically either seize property or burn property. And George, the owner, he tells the deputy, he says, that's fine if you want to give me a piece of paper. And he tells the deputy, he says, I want you to realize, he says, I'm doing my best here to follow the law as I know it. And he says, you know, we really believe in the Constitution. And he says, we're really, we've really done and went out of our way to work with you and try to get information. And the deputy says, I have a very large problem with the Constitution. I have, I have a big problem with that idea. Oh, really? The deputy said that. Now, you got a new sheriff in town, right? You used to have a uh, Sheriff Gilbertson. I remember he was, uh, he wrote a very long uh, article about how the federal government was infringing on people's rights and how it was the duty of the uh, sheriff to stand there and, and, uh, and, and protect the people locally. But there was an election last November and there's a new sheriff in town, right? Yes. Yes, that's true. And, uh, you know, and as you said, Gil Gilbertson, he was a, a very big supporter of the mining community. He still is. He, he he is quite aware of the situation. He has been doing what he can to help the the owners. So we do have a new sheriff, and, and we had actually met with him kind of before this all came to a head. He did come to one of our meetings, and he said, I, you know, and he admits, he says, I really don't know a lot about this. He says, I don't know where I stand. He says, you know, I would like to get educated. And we said, that, that's great. You know, we're looking forward to you know, more discussions. And then this kind of happened where, you know, he's in the middle of it. And my understanding is, is that he is actually doing his best to, to mediate this. And he has come out open publicly and said, you know, he has said similar, very similar to Gil Gilbertson that I will not tolerate people 
violating the rights and property of the local citizens that basically I am in, obligated to defend. So we're, we're very happy about that. So right but now you know, you're in a thanks. position, let, let's kind of sum up where you are right now. Uh, from what we've right. seen from Oath Keepers, who were in charge right. of uh, security for the area, they are in a security position right now. There's, this is not a standoff. Uh, the BLM right. has given a deadline, but so far there's been no moves towards that. Uh, the uh, Oath Keepers are asking for people who can come and help to provide security uh, to come to the area. But other than that, there is no uh, kind of a conflict there. And I think it's a very calming thing to have people there to provide security. That, I think prevents something like uh, uh, violence happening when there is uh, when there are people on both sides of the issue. But let's look at the bigger picture for just a moment, because we're just about out of time, Kirby. Yeah. I, when I was looking at this, I went back into uh, some of the archives of the area to see what was going on. I got some reports from the early 90s about how, this is 20 years ago, how the BLM was really cracking down on existing mines. And I think it's important for people who are listening to this, a lot of people think of uh, miners, they have a very negative view of them. They think they've, they've seen some of the destructive practices of open pit mining. Uh, that's not what's going on here. This is very small miners who have been working this in a more of a traditional uh, type of uh, posture. Is that correct? Uh, that's, that's correct. They're actually working the property in a similar way to the, it would have been worked in, say, the 30s. You know, they have a, mm -hmm. a small excavator to clean tunnels. They have a cabin. They have a very small mill. They can basically go in, extract rock, dig it up off the ground with a shovel, put it in an ore car, run it out there, and run it down to their mill and do things like that. And they have some larger equipment to maintain roads and obviously deal with, you know, large quantities of rock that may be left in piles that need moved. Things okay, so things, so things really haven't changed from the articles that I was looking at 20 years ago. But I thought it was right. interesting to see this LA Times article from 1994. They talked to a guy his name was uh, Jeff Garcia, or Jeff Garcia, and uh, he was a uh, geologist from Berkeley, and he talked about how he had worked a mine there at that time in 1994. He would worked it for 16 years, and basically they were making it impossible for him to continue operation. He had to pay a $300 permit because water was falling on his land and might cause runoff into the, uh, into the river, which, of course, other, uh, other operations, uh, farmers don't have to do that and shouldn't have to do that. And yet they give exemptions to large municipal areas. But I thought it was very interesting that they hit him with very stiff fines just because he had some sediment runoff. This was not the kind of heap leaching that some environmentalists have complained about that's been banned in some countries where they basically create a large open pit. They uh, excavate everything. They pulverize everything and then pour cyanide over it. This is nothing at all like this. This is, as you pointed out, traditional mining done by uh, small operators. This guy uh, spent half of his year in Alaska, half of it in Oregon with his wife, who was also a geologist. He had a lot of respect for the land, and he said this, Kirby. He said, society seems to have this guilt about disturbing the land. They still go to their big parking lots and their supermarkets, but if they have a chance to get rid of their guilt and nail some little miner on the hill, they feel like they've done their part to save the world. I think people need to see this in the proper context. They need to understand that this is part of the government's operations to shut down everybody's business, whether you are a small-time miner or whether you're a small-time retailer or a small-time manufacturer. They want to get the people out of it. But there's something else on these lands where people have had mineral rights or grazing rights or lumber rights. There's another aspect to this, and I think we can see it in what's going on in Arizona, where Senator John McCain just ran through in the National Defense Authorization Act uh, a process that is going to turn over an area that has recreational significance, it has historical significance to the Indians, and it has religious significance to the Indians who are there. And it was also protected in 1955, the same year that uh, right. your stuff got grandfathered in. What they're going to do is by turning it over to this foreign corporation, they're totally going to obliterate the area. This is not something where they're going in and just mining some minerals from underneath the surface. They're going to create a crater that can be seen from space. And this is what I think is going to happen. I want to get your opinion on this. This is what I think the end game is in all of these struggles running the people off the land. Because when we were at the Bundy Ranch, he was the last rancher still in business. They had run everybody else out of business with phony endangered species claims. And, of course, the desert tortoise that they were supposed to be protecting, they had rounded these things up, euthanized over a 1,000 of them because they said they didn't have the money to feed them. Yet they were financing an army 
to come against the Bundy family and to come against people who would uh, be on the land without their specific permission, attacking and assaulting people who were doing it. So when people go onto the BLM's land, they felt they had a right to assault and attack people, and yet when the BLM goes onto a gated property there in the Galice Mining District, uh, they get very upset if they're even asked to provide identification. Uh, I, I, I do want to clarify something there. It, it's actually not BLM's land. This is actually yes, exactly. land. That, yeah. This is actually land that is it is administrated and managed by the United States government for yes. the benefit of the American people. I misspoke. Um, yes, under, that's a very good point. Under, it's not under, their land. Under the under the Constitution, the federal government is very limited in what it can own. And basically, this is where the mining law came in and the Homestead Act came in, is that basically the government was required under the law to dispose of this land. And basically what that means is pass into, into private ownership and basically allow the average person to benefit from it and basically make a living and make some sort of life for himself from it, and in turn, do something for the country. It, it's funny you mentioned Jeff Garcia. Jeff, Gar Jeff is actually a, a pretty good friend of ours. He is still there in Belize. He's still going strong. But you're right. He, it, it is exactly as he said. Uh, you know, I remember a comment he made to me one time. He said, when you're in court with these people, he said, you realize you're the only one sitting there not getting paid that day. <laughs> yeah, and, that's right. They starve you out. And he, and Thank you for he's correcting very, me. That very right about that. Yeah, he's very, very right about that. And I am aware of the situation down there in Arizona, in Arizona with the Apache land, and that is not something that we support. I mean, obviously, we do support mining, and we recognize that you know we need the minerals, and our society we we do utilize a lot of minerals. Almost everything we use is a mineral. You know, it derives from it. You know, basically, you know, we all, we're all there. You know, we all always say, if it can't be grown, it must be mined. So we do need the minerals, but at the same time, most no, of yeah. us who are in the mining community. But the, but really, the, I think the issue, uh, yeah. Kirby, is that they want to take it away from the small people who live in the community. They want to take the uh, land oh. away from the people who would manage it locally. And of course, that's the big issue oh. out west as to right. who the land belongs to, who it should be, who the public lands right. should be managed by. And everybody is starting to wake up, I think, out west and say, these are public lands. They don't need to be managed by the federal government because they're doing a very poor job of it. And they are trying to expunge all of the individuals out of the area in an Agenda 21 kind of way so they can turn this over to large corporations who will obliterate it for all uses that everybody has, completely destroy the area rather than use it responsibly. And I think if we want to have responsible use of the land, it is best done at the local level. So I think that's a, a very big movement. When I said the BLM land, of course, that's the way the BLM is acting, as if it was their private property. Right. And we need to understand that it isn't. And as you point out, there's constitutional cases to be made that uh, the government uh, doesn't have the right to keep this much land. And we all know that from a practical standpoint, it shouldn't be done in that way. Well, we're going to continue to follow this. We're out of time. We've uh, we've gone quite a long ways on this uh, interview. But uh, we'll be in touch with you to see what happens. And, of course, if anybody wants to support this operation, we will put the information on the uh, video as to where they can uh, make donations to uh, the Oath Keepers who are providing security or to the miners who have a large uh, legal fight ahead of them. The Galice Mining District has a legal fight that they're asking for donations to establish their rights. We need to understand that if you don't have uh, property rights that are recognized by the government, if they can take them from one person, if they can take them from the miners, or they can take them from the ranchers, they can take them from you, even if you just have a suburban home. So we need to all understand that this affects all of us. Any last comments, uh, Kirby? Uh, that's that's absolutely correct, and as as we say, as we miners say here locally, if you don't know about property, you probably are property. That's right. You know, or you're going That's to right. lose it. So, tell us, uh, tell us how uh, they can uh, support your, uh, where they can go to get information and to make a donation. Uh, if people want to get information as far as what's going on at the mine and how they can help, they should go to Oath Keepers, J O C O. That's Joco, mm -hmm. Oath Keepers, J O C O. dot com. And that is Josephine County Oath Keepers. They are the on-the-ground guys. You know, they do have needs. If people want to support them with, with food and things of that nature, please go there, get in touch with their people. If you want to support the mine owners, please go to sugarpinemine.com. 
and that is the official website. You can also go to GaliseMining.com. That is our district site. Either one of those sites, we have a lot of information. If you go to SugarPineMine.com, you can send the miners a donation either by check directly to the owners or you can contribute through PayPal through okay. there. All right, great. And uh, uh, the, the thing I really want to reiterate is uh, that, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm very close to the two owners of this mine, and they're not the only miners in this area under attack. There's actually several others that they're having problems. They're not to this level. But these are the two guys who've stood up. I was actually on the mine uh, yesterday with one of the owners who's a good friend of mine, and we were standing there. There's a very old stamp mill on the mine that's been there for many years, and they have a title to it. And we were looking at that, and uh, he said, you know, he says, as long as I'm alive, he says, that is always going to be there. You know, well, I hope, it, many, many I hope it is. I hope that uh, they will respect your property uh -huh. rights. I hope you prevail in court. I hope this goes through peacefully, but we'll keep an eye on this. And we'll be having uh, an interview with the Oath Keepers. We are trying to establish contact with a couple of individuals there that we'll have on for interviews in the next couple of days. Thank you so much for joining us. Kirby Jackson with the Galise Mining District. And, of course, what they're trying to do is get a legal hearing to go through the legal process to stop the BLM from acting precipitously by giving them a deadline before they've given them answers, before they've had their hearing, before they have taken this through the court. And that's the important function that's being done now by the Oath Keepers, essentially setting up security to let them know that there's somebody there in case they're going to uh, try to storm the area. Hopefully that will stop that from happening so this can take its way all the way through the court.